to the public with both in-person attendance at the City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and remote attendance as well. Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and remotely via Zoom. There are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting via Zoom and make public comment during the meeting is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website or on YouTube. As always, this meeting is Cablecast Live on Spectrum Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T UVerse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays at 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our technician tonight is Melissa. As a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Okay. Um, so first, I will do a roll call and pledge or roll call. <laughs> Commissioner Esty here. Commissioner Westman here. Commissioner Wilk here. Vice Chair Jensen here. And Chair Christensen here. Okay. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Um, do we have any uh, additions or deletions to the agenda? No additions or deletions this evening. <laughs> Thanks. Um, additional materials. There's uh, additional information submitted to the city after. Um, is, there's uh, item 7A, correspondence received. Do we, for additional materials? Yes, uh, staff received one PowerPoint presentation after the agenda was originally published. And that was added to the agenda packet and posted online and pr produced in the back as well. Thank you. Okay, and um, item four is oral communications. Um, this evening, I, I just wanted to remind you, we've been, with these meetings, we often go back to the video to pull information from the Planning Commission and direction. So just trying to keep your microphone close and if you can hear it in the background, it means you're doing a great job. So it, it just, it, if it doesn't pick up, we can't hear what you said in the video later. So we'll take notes, but please be mindful of that. Second, um, there, there is going to be a special town hall next week. Um, and that is on February 21st, which I believe is Wednesday at 6 p.m. in city council chambers. So please help us get the word out. Um, the two buildings at the end of the wharf are um, in needing, needing demolition and we really wanna engage the public and talk about next steps and where this is headed. So um, we're in the next year, we'll be doing a robust public outreach and discussing what will happen at the end of the wharf in the future. But just if you can help us get the word out, um, we'd love to have people there and collect feedback as well as there'll be a presentation on exactly what's going on at the end of the wharf and why the buildings need to come down as well as next steps. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, or, thank you. Um, oral communications. <laughs> Hi, my name is Goran Klopic. I live here locally in Sokel. I shoot baskets every day almost at Jade Street Park, where I encounter sometimes gang activity, uh, such as uh, gang signs uh, being posted in the men, men's restroom. That's not only uh, that one hotspot that I encountered. One time I made a call to, uh, to an officer that I know personally very well when somebody uh, painted a gang sign, uh, I don't call it graffiti, graffiti is very ugly. I'm from Europe, I know what graffiti art is. Uh, somebody by Whole Foods, in the back of Whole Foods, somebody painted a gang sign there 
on 41st Avenue to mark the territory. That's uh, for gang activity, always like that. So that's that was on my chest uh, to uh, begin with. Um, I hope that uh, one day, my dear friend, uh, Sarah Ryan, she's, she's the captain of uh, Capitola PD department, will be the police chief. So uh, that things can change drastically sometimes. Thank you very much for listening. Go, uh, take care. God bless you. Bye bye. Thank you. Um, I think we took. Is there anybody else? Hearing none. Um, I think we took care of the staff comments before the oral communications. But um, having no commission comments. All right. Moving on to the consent calendar. There are none? Okay. Uh, now we're moving into public hearings. Uh, public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public to dis public discussion of each item listed as a public hearing. The following procedure is as follows. Staff presentation, planning commission questions, public comment, planning commission deliberation, and decision. Um, item A is citywide zoning code update. Project description is a permit, excuse me, <clears throat> Permit number 24-0026 for future amendments to the Capitola Municipal Code Title 17 zoning. The first zoning code ordinance amendments will impact the development standards and regulations for properties citywide. The co zoning code is part of the city's local coastal program. The LCP and amendments require certification by the California Coastal Commission prior to taking effect in the coastal zone. Recommended action, provide feedback to staff on zoning discussion items and direct staff to prepare an ordinance to amend Capitola Municipal Code Title 17 zoning. Thank you. Okay, with that, we'll jump in. Um, so I'm excited to introduce Ben Noble to you tonight. I think a few of you know Ben well, and Ben may be a new face for others. Uh, ben has worked on our zoning, he worked on our general plan, um, he was at the last meeting via Zoom, and he's here in person tonight to lead us through some of the more difficult topics associated with the housing element update. So Ben Noble of Ben Noble Planning, welcome. And I'm just going to jump into the, um, the work session. And tonight will be an open dialogue. If you have any questions, feel free to raise a hand, and we can answer questions. And then we'll get to certain slides where we're asking for feedback from the Planning Commission directly. So. Is this working okay? Yeah. Okay, this is the microphone that works apparently. So good evening, planning commissioners. Again, my name is Ben Noble. Happy to be here tonight. So as Katie mentioned, I've uh, been working for Capitola for a long time. I think uh, over 16 years at this point, off and on. Worked on the general plan update that was adopted 10 years ago. The zoning code um, update adopted in 2000 and more recently, a variety of zoning code amendments, including the SB9 ordinance, uh, the objective standards for multi-unit residential development, and other miscellaneous zoning code amendments. I'm an independent consultant specializing in development code updates as well as general land use planning. So I'm really happy to be back in Capitola tonight to talk to you about um, these uh, topics related to the zoning code update and zoning code amendments. So um, as you're aware, the housing element uh, identifies uh, a number of uh, zoning code amendments that are necessary in order to uh, implement the recently adopted housing element. In your packet, there's a list of all of those uh, topics. And tonight, we would like to focus on five of these topics to share with you some background information, and then to get your initial feedback, which we're going to then use as we draft the amendments and bring them back to you for your consideration. So on the screen are these five topics. And um, what we propose for tonight is for each of these topics, uh, we'll give a little bit of background information, share some um, possible approaches to address in the zoning code amendments, and then to have a planning commission discussion for you to give us feedback that we could then use 
um, as we move forward with drafting the amendments. So with that, the first topic is um, missing middle housing. And there are two programs in the housing element related to this topic that calls for the city to develop strategies to provide for missing middle housing, and then also to allow corner lots and single family neighborhoods to accommodate duplex units. So when we say missing middle housing, what we're talking about is smaller scale multi-unit residential development that fits in to the um, character of a single family neighborhood. Uh, here are some examples of housing types that fall within the missing middle category. So it will include duplexes, uh, a, a housing type that's sometimes called a, a side court, where you have um, multiple units that are on one side of the lot with a driveway providing vehicle access on the other side. And it could be more intensive where the units are attached um, to one another. Uh, you can have a housing type that's called a motor court, where you might have a central driveway um, that provides access to units that way. Um, and I should say that these images uh, on the screen come from a um, resource prepared by AMBAG um, that identifies uh, infill housing types uh, within Santa Cruz County to be a resource for jurisdictions to use when they're thinking about uh, lower intensity uh, residential infill within the communities in the region. And so um, given that's what missing middle housing is, as referred to in the housing element, the question then is, well, um, is missing middle housing currently allowed in Capitola? And so on the screen is a zoning map showing the um, zoning districts within the city. And so within the R1 zone in your single family uh, zoning district, um, you can have one primary dwelling. You can have a primary dwelling with an ADU, um, but you can also have um, two primary dwelling units per lot under SB9, which is the state law that requires jurisdictions to allow for um, two primary dwelling units on a single lot within a single family zoning district, provided that um, the unit meets specified criteria, uh, within state law as well as any locally adopted ordinance, which Capitola does have. So it's important to keep in mind that already within the R1 zoning district, um, some of these missing middle type um, uh, or missing middle housing typologies are, are already permitted. Uh, some of you may recall that when the city adopted the SB9 ordinance, um, we were looking at um, what is required under state law and how best to accommodate that within Capitola. So on the screen are some of the, di uh, some of the um, diagrams that we used with this work. So on the left here is a um, typical 5,500 square foot lot. And under SB9, the city needs to allow a lot split and then two primary build uh, two primary dwelling units on each of those lots, um, with those units being um, up to 1,200 square feet. So you can see the resulting density on a project like that, um, if one were to be proposed, is um, 32 dwelling units per acre, so relatively dense. As you know, in Capitola, there are residential lots that are smaller than 5,500 square feet in some of your neighborhoods. And so in those cases, the city still needs to allow up to four units with a lot split, um, and the densities can get pretty high in that case. So as dense as 62 dwelling units per acre with 700 square feet per unit, if there were to be an SB9 project um, on a lot, um, that's uh, 2,800 square feet. So that's currently what's allowed in the R1 zoning district um, under SB9. So moving into the multifamily zones, is there, is there a question? Uh -huh. Sorry, um, how do um, setbacks come into play when we look at that, like that illustration? Right there? So um, the city is required to accept four foot setbacks from the side and the rear property lines. And front? Front um, can be what the city has, but 
um, in our ordinance, um, we found, or in our studies for the ordinance, we found that we could accommodate um, the required four units with a front setback on larger lots, but on smaller lots, um, that becomes infeasible. So the city had to make some trade-offs. And what the city ultimately decided is that it would rather accommodate the on-site parking with the units moved up to the front without a front setback. It was a trade-off. The city couldn't um, accomplish everything that it wanted to under state law. So ultimately, city council decided that this was preferred. So on the smaller lots, didn't we go to three stories? We, uh, or two and a half, I think. Two and a half. We did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's the R1 zone. Have, has there been any SB9 applications in the city? Yeah, we've had inquiries, but one that came through, so in Depot Hill. So that's the R1 zoning district. And then there's um, the multifamily zone, so the RM. And um, on, on the screen is just a summary of the development standards that apply within the RM zoning districts. And I think the most important is um, the parcel area per unit and the density, uh, they're both sort of um, related to one another. So in the, low, in the RML, allowed 10 dwelling units per acre. In the RMM, you're allowed 15 dwelling units per acre. In the RMH, you're allowed 20 dwelling units per acre. And that maximum density is the primary standard that dictates what kind of um, multifamily, multi-unit residential development is possible within these areas. And just to jump in for a minute, you'll recall we had a lot of examples in our general, in our housing element of different densities. And these numbers are much lower than some of the developments you, we have in town that go up to 40 dwelling units per acre and in the 30s along Park Avenue, the larger buildings, so. Yeah. Just as a frame of reference, a, a typical townhome development um, sort of with modern parking provisions is about 12 dwelling units per acre. A typical sort of garden style two-story apartment might be 20 dwelling units per acre, for example. Okay, so it's interesting to compare um, the development standards in the RM zones to these missing middle typologies that we were looking at before. So looking at the um, the AM bag prototypes that they prepared for the infill design toolkit, um, most of these are not would not be possible within the RM zoning district. So a duplex on a smaller lot um, wouldn't be allowed um, in RML and RMM. Uh, detached side court, detached motor court. Um, I can't see what this thing down here. Um, also would not be allowed um, in the I can move it. Oh, hi. All right. And then and then also the um, the four unit development that would be allowed under SB nine in um, larger R one zoning districts that also would not be allowed in all of the RM districts um, because of the density limitation. So um, for us, that sort of raises some questions um, that we would like Planning Commission feedback on. Given what the housing element says about um, exploring, allowing for missing middle housing um, in um, Capitola, as well as allowing for duplexes on corner lots within the R1 zone. Um, we, uh, Katie and I um, see a number of options to consider that we'd like your feedback on. So um, in the R1 zone, one option is to just continue to only rely on SB9, to not go any further from that um, and just leave it as it is. Um, another option would be to allow duplex homes on all corner lots subject to the same development standards as a single family home. 
So within that development envelope that's allowed in R1 for a single family home to say, okay, as long as the duplex fits within that development envelope and provides for two units, rather two primary dwelling units rather than one, that would be allowed. And then a third option, which is sort of a mid middle ground between those two, is to say that, okay, on um, lots that meet the minimum lot size standard of 5,000 square feet on a corner lot, okay, you can do a duplex there, but on smaller corner lots, say in neighborhoods where um, typical lot sizes are um, non-conforming and smaller than 5,000, um, you wouldn't be able to do a duplex. Instead, if you wanted more than one primary dwelling, dwelling unit on that lot, you would need to rely on SB9 and the size limitations that come with that. Question. Actually, two questions. Okay. Uh -huh. One is um, the, uh, so the feedback from HCD was we don't have enough middle housing, and yet you just pointed out all these areas where we do and and SB nine act activity that we can allow. So what what are we missing? What where where are we falling short in terms of the housing element? So I think you're, you're absolutely correct. We have a lot of options in our R1 right now from SB9 and ADUs. So this is to allow duplexes within our R1 zone, which currently um, they'd be limited in, t in terms of like a single family home with a um, ADU or else an SB9 development, which has a maximum square footage, but a duplex would the way that this is set up would be subject to the single family home standards. So if you're on a 5,000 square foot lot and you could build a 2,400 square foot duplex, it's kind of an incentive rather than going the SB9 route where the units have to be smaller. So, um, SB9 would, would limit you to, um, Parcel, the, the parcel being split with the two 300 square foot um, units on each parcel. Is that right? So the SB9, you could, on one lot, you could develop two primary homes, but they're limited in their square footage. Um, or you can go even further and subdivide the lot and have two single family homes on each lot. So, yeah, this the, adding the duplex under option two would provide an incentive not to go the SB9 route because you could have a home that's a regular size that functions as a duplex. We went through and, um, oh wait, so, so you wouldn't have to split the lot. You could just say, okay, I'm just building a duplex on my, on, on my lot and it, I'm not invoking SB9. And, right. Yep. And, and again, HCD said you don't have an, you don't have enough incentive for this middle housing these this options. Would, this would be one more incentive in our toolbox. So it would be in our land use table where we list single family as a permitted use. We would have duplex as a permitted use with a note that says on corner lots only. I mean, you could go further and say, we'd like to allow duplexes on all lots in the single family zone. But this is what we committed to in the housing element update was to look at corner lots for duplexes. So you had a dialogue with the HCD, I'm assuming, and they said you need more middle housing. And you, and you said, well, SB9 is one way to do it. And they said, well, that's not a, really an incentive. And duplexes came up and they said, well, yeah, if you had more duplexes, or then, then maybe we approve it or something. Yeah, HCD. HCD told us um, we need to go beyond the, what the state has allowed. So this is us creating our own um, land use allow, allotment within the, the R1. So when we got our comments from um, HCD, it was that we need to go beyond what, because we said, well, we've already got SB9 and we've got all the ADUs and we're up to date and this is us going beyond. And we identified some lots in our housing element that we called out that could be duplexes. Was that correct? On corner lots, yep. And then um, how does that work from uh, like 
selling standpoint, you know, duplexes a lot of times are sold um, not as one unit. Um, it, it would be um, one ownership. We um, we wouldn't set it up that it could be condoed, so it would just be unless the planning commission wanted them to be able to be sold separately. But it would for a property owner, there'd be one owner, and they could rent both units. And then, um, how does uh, the parking requirements work? Is it, does it differ between a, a duplex or a single family home? Yep, um, a duplex requires two spaces per unit. A single family home, it depends on the square footage of the unit. So can we, I'm, I'm lost a little bit on the math when you see it's an advantage to do this. If we go back to page 14 on a 2,800 square foot lot, two units end up being 1,400 per unit if we use SB9. That basically you fill up the lot with houses. And if we adopt this rule saying corner lots need to use the standard residential requir R1 requirements for FAR, mm -hmm. don't those duplexes end up being smaller than these 1,400 square foot things? So why would I want to do that mm -hmm. if I'm maximizing my floor area, which most people try to do? I'm a little lost on the map. Okay, so you're at, at the top right, two units, 20, right. 2,800 square foot lot. Um, Remind me what your FAR is for R1? I'm going to look that up right now. The only one I know is 4,000 square feet is 0.56. It's scaled. So I was trying to do a, that one to see if it was feasible. That ends up being 1120 per duplex on a corner lot that's 4,000 square feet, which we, I think, have a fair number of uh, those, kind of following up on Jerry's comment about what's the opportunity here. I don't know, I don't know how many corner lots we have that are above 5,000 square foot. So if the maximum FAR, and if, let's, just, let's just for like to keep it simple in our heads, a 5,000 square foot lot maximum FAR of approximately 0.5. So 25. Like 0.58 or something. 0.58 for the 2,800. 2,500. So um, um, total, just in my mind, to keep it simple, 2,500. So let's say approximately 1,200. Yeah. Okay. So maybe a little bit, they could maybe achieve a little bit more um, floor area under a, um, a traditional duplex as opposed to an SB9 project. I think that the city, there would be advantages from the city's perspective to see a duplex rather than an SB9 unit because they would have to comply with the minimum setback requirements. And so if somebody were to take that option rather than the SB9 option for whatever reason, I think we would want that. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would prefer that because of because of the um, buildings being set back a little bit more. Right, but we're trying to and the increased parking. So under SB nine, we have to accept one parking unit, one parking space per per um, per unit. Um, whereas with a traditional duplex, depending on the size of the floor area, you you require two spaces per unit. Yep. Applicants or the city's perspective. <laughs> so SB9 has to be approved through a ministerial process. So it would be less, much less expensive um, and much quicker process for an applicant. I'm just trying to understand why anyone would want to go the duplex route. So one thing is you're limited to 16 feet in height, 20 if you, um, for a one-story building. A two-story building has to have a plate height of 20. So you, you can get the 25 feet within the R1. So you can build to the regular standards. But um, I was just looking up all the what the square footage requirements are. SB9. SB9, yeah. So if you have um, up to two units, it's 1,200 square feet each. But then once you go to three units, it drops down to 800 square feet each. But I, I see your point, Paul, of... On a smaller lot, SB9 is probably more advantageous than a duplex in terms of the math. So, um, Step back. yeah. When we heard from HCD, did they just want this middle housing in the R1 district or do they want it citywide? Because it seems like 
we have a lot of opportunities in our multi-residential districts to come up with situations where we could add more middle housing. So both. Both. Um, yeah, they, they did ask us specifically, we're supposed to look at duplexes on corner lots for the R1, but then we're also supposed to look at our density limits within our multifamily. Yeah. So um, we, could, we could come back with options for the duplex. That's kind of, um, I guess one question for the Planning Commission is, do you think, would you prefer to see duplexes on corner lots rather than SB9 development that can come closer to the street, have minimal setbacks? Because we could set up the, we could look at what the um, incentives are there and try to make it more advantageous than the SB9. Is in terms of the drainage um, issue that we're talking about, I think our last work session with parcel splits, I mean, there's nothing, you're considering the entire parcel when you're doing a parcel split to, to then decide which tier you're falling under. Mm -hmm. um, when we do a just straight duplex, I mean, that's not considering that type of tiered drainage, right? So, I mean, would that be an advantage for the applicant? They don't have to go through, with when they go through SB9, they would have to go through all the, the drainage evaluation, but with the parcel, um, um, the duplex, would that be a factor? <laughs> yeah, we would we would look at it for both, but most likely they wouldn't um, tear it out. Tier become a tier two or tier three if it's just a, a essentially the same development as a single family home. Yeah, um, so that would be an advantage as well. I mean, for for me, we talked about this before. I think duplexes on corner lots make so much sense. And, you know, it seems like that one is sort of a, a no-brainer for uh, the city to do that. It's just how do we figure out a way to do it where there is some incentive for people to do the duplex rather than the SB9? Because uh, if you build a building that looks basically like, you know, the same size as a single-family house, it's going to go there, but you'd let it be two units, I mean, that really doesn't have much of an impact on the neighborhood. What's the maximum size of an ADU on that? Um, is it, I think it's, yeah. yeah it's like it depends on how many bedrooms you have. Right, well, a, a two-bedroom ADU at 1,200 square feet, which can be attached to your house, would be just like a duplex that we're talking about because it can't be sold anyways. Yep. Right. Yeah, this is very similar to... All the other solutions that are out there but it's something new and it goes beyond what's required by state law i think the only other thing would be to look at is by the site specific i mean i agree with susan's comment on corner lots but um you know usually on a corner lot you know you get to an intersection if you're now you're having a, a what a, a curb cut for a new parking at 20 feet you know on a corner and you already you know it's already struggling with that which is something that would be interesting to see what site by site. I mean, because if we approve this on all corner lots, then it kind of takes the evaluation of if that's safe or whatever kind of out of the hands of the city, right? I mean, it would just be automatic? No, we could review these with a design permit. So we, what we're, um, I do think we should put some objective standards in there as well. Um, one would be definitely for a parking lot, like the parking access, maybe suggesting that they only have one driveway cut, but if they do two, that they be a certain distance from the intersection. Um, the other is like um, just how the building faces, where the entrance is relative to facing the street, so it looks like single families from both. But we can that would be something we could get into the details on if there's general support to go with option two, and then we'll come back with some objective standards to try to make it fit. Most duplex that you see set up, you know, and they have, they usually have parking on like entrances of both sides. I mean, they are clearly defined. So that'd just be um, interesting. Some seems, corner residential lots. Seems like one of the difficulties we have is we do have some little, very small lots. And so, 
um, would they be upset if we went to, you know, allowing duplexes on corner lots that are, say, you know, 3,200 square feet or, you know, some number in there that becomes workable, and I don't know exactly what it would be. But then we, we would have, I mean, we don't want to see a duplex try and go on, uh, you know, uh, you know, I think there's some thousand square foot lots in in my neighborhood, and um, I mean, I can think of the one on the corner of Riverview and Blue Gum. There, I, I don't think that lot's even a thousand square feet. Uh, so I think we need to have some minimum standard in there. Certainly not five thousand square feet, but something in the thirty-two hundred square foot range. Many, many of our lots are 40 by 80, and I'm actually going to look towards, towards Sean right now because I know Sean does a lot of mapping for us, and I think a 40 by 80 would cover most, of, not all of our lots, but I think that would be a good that, cutoff point. But I'm just yes. looking to Sean to see if he agrees or if he thinks it should be a little bit lower. Okay, so 40 to 70 and 40 to 80 are 40 by 80, 40 by 70. So 3,200 or else 2,800. So that would be. I, I would be happy with the 3,200 if that works for other people. I don't, I don't necessarily have too much of a problem with um, the minimum size lot. I think the. Near Pleasure Point, there's a lot of small lots that people have very small duplexes on that are just little surf shacks, and it seemed to work out all right. But, I mean, they still have to adhere to setbacks and, and all that other development standards, design standards, right? So even if they had a small lot, they would still have to, they can't just build directly to zero lot line. Correct, yeah. There, there would be no, like, guaranteed allowance on with this sb9 has a guaranteed allowance that they can move into certain areas if they can't quite fit the development yeah it would just be a shame if somebody had you know just under the threshold and they didn't want to go through the full sb9 and they were beholden to um kind of the subjective that we didn't necessarily intend to address them <laughs> So I'm hearing um, with option um, option two under Chair Christensen's opinion would be the best, and then under um, Commissioner Westman option three, but having a 3,200 square foot minimum for the lot size. And if the rest of you could weigh in on that, that'd be fantastic. So, so that I'm just still confused and basically on Paul's point. So the duplex, are there instances where you would opt for a duplex where you'd have a larger floor area ratio than SB9? On a larger lot, yes. On a small lot, no. Okay. Just to add, add to that, there, there are other eligibility criteria for SB9 having to do with recent sort of rental history of the units. And so there may be, there may be some instances where um, SB9 is just not possible on a lot, but a, um, a, a typical duplex. So with regards to then the small lots, um, the duplex doesn't buy you anything. You could always default to SB9, but you're saying on the larger lots, we would then go with the duplex. They um, It would be advantageous to go like on the corner lot on a large lot to have a duplex because um, you could put get more floor area ratio than if you went at the SB9 route. Correct. So up in Cliffwood Heights, corner lot, 6,000 square feet, you'd get more square foot. So your concern about the small lots doesn't apply. Uh, 
try the FB9 route first. I tried all those routes. I'm sorry for my confusion, but it, it's, it seems like option two covers it because if, if the duplex it makes sense on only the larger lots and on smaller lots, they can just default to SB9 to get the FAR that they're looking for. And we don't need to go option three because option two just adds our, the middle housing fills in that gap we're missing. Kind of, maybe. Yeah, and option two, if they came in with a duplex, it would at least come before the planning commission on a small lot, whereas SB9, it's administrative review by staff and it's su subject to our, so it could get, yeah, closer to the setbacks. And so there, there's, we're just, Opening up options yeah. <laughs> to call the. Because it's just weird to see a, a word of all corner lot. You know, because there's every corner lot could be subject. Yeah, but, but, but the reality is, I mean, if you do the math on the small lots, there's, you're going to end up with like 600 square feet each duplex, right? Because of our standards. So nobody's going to do that. I would assume most people would not do that if they had another route to get something that they really thought. So I'm okay, I'm okay with option two, and as Peter said, just let them figure out if they need to go the SB9 route and go through all the hoops. Okay, our tech it's sort of, it's, it's, me. I just, sort of self, you know, eliminates. Yeah. <laughs> our tech is um, concerned that they their the mics aren't picking up. So just a reminder to bring the bring your mic nice and close. <laughs> I mean, option two works fine for me as well. I just think it's going to create some expectations that aren't going to be able to be fulfilled. I think we, we've heard from all commissioners on the R1 missing middle, and then there's the question of um, missing middle housing in the RM zoning districts. And um, this is maybe part of a larger um, discussion about allowed density um, within the RM zoning districts, but just focusing narrowly on the missing middle question, um, given that existing development regulations prohibit um, a lot of these missing middle housing types within our RM zoning districts, um, uh, one um, potential uh, zoning code amendment would be to modify the RM development standards to allow these projects and that would likely in, include um, um, some kind of increase to building coverage, maybe not a lot, but probably some, um, but most significantly a reduction in the um, minimum parcel area per unit as well as an increase in the maximum density. So we're interested in planning commission reaction to this. And I'll just remind you for that RML at 4,400 square feet, our single family zone is at 5,000. So it's really low. It, there's, um, there's almost no difference, you know, 600 square feet for parcel size. So does anyone have any questions on how this works? Like for the low density for each unit, you have to have 4,400 square feet of land area. And then medium density, it's, 2,500, and then high density is 22. For me, I could live with an increase in the building coverage. Um, you know, 40% is pretty low. And um, I could also uh, reduce the parcel size, particularly in the RM low. Um, you know, it seems like that number could come down. Um, and, uh, you know, in, then as a result of those, the density is going to increase. Yeah. I don't know if it's possible, but on, could you give us, uh, go back to page eight and look at the, that, those duplexes, they look like the real pictures, so they're real somewhere. Do you have any idea, Ben, what those numbers would be, the equivalent numbers would be in this locale? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, House on the bottom is on probably a um, 4,000 square foot, 100 by 
40, yeah, 4,000 square foot lot. Yep. So um, two units there. Um, so yeah, so two minimum lot size of 2,000 square feet per unit. And then the top is probably a slightly larger lot. Yeah, looks like it. So yeah, they, they reduced the size, mm -hmm. parcel size, but effectively parcel size. If, you, if you'd like, I can pull up the densities of from our general plan that we presented prior, just to give you an idea of, would that be helpful? Okay. This will not be on Zoom, but I don't know how many people are watching. <clears throat> we need to stop. Um, well, just to give you, I could talk you through some of these if you want to pull up your slides, or you could go to the general plan online. But like Bay Avenue, 750 Bay Avenue, the senior housing is at 22 dwelling units per acre. So that would be high density. Uh, Jade Street and Ruby Court area, um, it's at 22.8 dwelling units per acre, so the development right across from the Jade Street Park. Um, the Villas of Capitola, 925 46th Avenue, are at 23 dwelling units per acre. 900 Capitola Avenue, I think that's the, the mansion, mm -hmm. and that's at 25 dwelling units per acre. Sorry. So at 25 dwelling units per acre, you're already beyond what can be done at, in, in any of our at high density. Um, Opal Cliff Drive, the smaller units, or the Opal Cliff Drive right at the corner after you go over Stockton Bridge, the two big condos are at 28.8 dwelling units per acre. The Beach Villas, 1066 41st Avenue, right next to the rail trail, um, are almost at, they're at 29 dwelling units per acre. So I don't know if, if that's helpful to know if what ranges you'd be care like be comfortable with for the high, if something should be able to be developed up to the beach villa density of almost 30 units per acre or, um, you know. I think one example that's often used is, um, you know, there are two projects in town that were developed by the same developer. The one over on Ruby Court, Jade Street area, you know, those sort of fourplexes in there. And uh, when they got developed, there was a pretty big outcry in town at that point that they were way too dense, you know, not what Capitola wanted. And they were working on the project up on Kennedy Capitola Knowles, I think it's called at the same time. So they greatly, uh, that's where this 40% and uh, I think 4,400 square feet came up at that time, because I think that's what that project is developed at. So um, for me, the unknown in what we can't control is the design because like the, the Bay Avenue Seniors Project, that works great there. And, you know, that, that density doesn't bother me at all. Um, I, I do think that, you know, sort of the Fourpex Project over on Ruby Court in that area, that seems more cluttered and dense, even though it, it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely we could raise our densities. Yeah. And always when we're thinking about raising densities, there's also the acknowledging that there's the state density bonus. So whatever we raise them to, they can always go higher if it's an affordable project. So, okay, well, we'll take a look at that. Um, the Ruby Court project, and I, I think you're right about the design, has a lot to do with the outcome. So that's at 22, almost 23 dwelling units per acre. 
um, so the villas of Capitola are at 24, that's 925 46th Avenue. But I think the one up the street is at, that's at 25 dwelling units per acre, that's the, um, at 900 Capitola Avenue. So that, that's actually right on the corner, um, which is different. It's like an apartment building, one building. It, they've got some open space around it. And um, so in drafting this, I, I wish, um, maybe you could pull up our website just so they can take a look. I think for me, it's going to be sort of hard tonight to say, well, that number should go up to from 10 to 17% because we really, you know, don't have too many examples of that. Um, you know, maybe we can get a consensus that we think, you know, uh, the numbers can go up. There can be more density in the multifamily zone. And when they come back, you can give us some examples and we can sort of choose between those examples because uh, I, I think tonight we could waste a lot of time trying to figure out something that we don't really understand. And that was exactly our expectation, just sort of the green light that the Planning Commission is open to exploring increased densities. And if that's the case, we'll come back with more information. Yeah, all of our examples are beyond... 20 yeah. dwelling units per acre, so we'll, we'll bring some lower ones for you, too. Okay. I can't actually see my... So are we ready to move on to the next topic? Okay. So the next topic is alternative housing types. So there's a program in the housing element to um, review and revise as appropriate the zoning code to facilitate alternative housing types. And the housing element uh, provides some examples of alternative housing types, including SROs, live work, micro units, and co-housing. So, um, just, you know, a few um, definitions. So single room occupancy, SRO, uh, means a single room dwelling unit with um, limited food preparation or sanitary facilities. So usually with some shared kitchen or bathroom facility or residence and typically 4,000 square feet or less for the unit. And there are some local examples such as El Centro in Santa Cruz um, and then over the hill in San Jose. Um, here's an example. This is actually transitional housing for persons experiencing homelessness, whereas in Santa Cruz, this is more permanent housing in the SRE, SRO units. So that's one example of an alternative housing type. Co-housing is another, where you have residences with some sort of um, shared indoor and outdoor um, space, um, really focused on creating an interde interdependent community life. And there are some local examples as well, uh, Coyote Crossing in Santa Cruz, as well as the New Brighton co-housing. So private residences plus shared facilities um, for residents within the development. Uh, micro units. Um, micro units are distinguished from SRO units in that um, they are completely self-contained units with complete kitchen 
and bathroom facilities um, in these small units are typically um, 350 square feet or less. And uh, the recently approved Center Street project in Santa Cruz um, has some um, micro units as part of the project. And then in Berkeley, we see a lot of micro units as well, and um, you see a lot of them as well in San Francisco and other sort of much higher density intensity areas. And so this is actually a plan view of a micro unit in Berkeley. Here is a photograph of the unit. I think this is about 300 square feet. Okay, and then live work. Um, it is a space that contain, contains both a residence and a place of work for one or more of the residents of the unit. And we have examples locally, um, the tannery in Santa Cruz, as well as Swift Street in Santa Cruz. These are live work units that focus on um, uh, artists and artisans. Okay, so um, we're looking for some preliminary planning commission input on what if anything, the zoning code should do to promote um, these different types of alternative housing. Um, and um, so on the slide, I, I for SROs, there's what the existing code uh, says. And so currently an SRO um, is allowed in Capitola. It's classified as group housing, which includes other types of um, group housing like dormitories. And it's permitted. Uh, in the RM, sort of a by right use, um, and requires a, a CUP in the MUN and in the village. Um, so if the city wanted to do more to promote um, SROs, uh, what is possible is the city could define SROs as a sort of separate from other types of group housing, um, could allow this use as a permitted use in the mixed use zones um, and could establish additional objective standards as needed given that that use would then become sort of by right and wouldn't be subject to the usual conditional use permit process. Um, so that's for SROs. And I have similar slides for other alternative housing types. Do you want to talk about SROs now or do you want to see similar information about the Alternative, other alternative housing types. I'd like to see the information of the four housing types and then we can talk about the different uh, how it would cost the city. Okay, I'll proceed with, with I'll proceed with the others. Okay, so for co-housing, uh, currently your zoning code is silent on co-housing and um, if the city wanted to, in the zoning code, do more to promote housing, co-housing, what you could do is you could define co-housing development, have a def definition of this use type, um, identify this as a permitted use in the R1 and the RM zones so that there's no um, uh, confusion or discrepancy about whether this is a permitted use or not. So is it... It's Typical co-housing situation, like a senior center, where there's a central dining area, and then they all have their own units. Is that an example, or is that something separate? So that would be that would be something separate, but it would be, I guess, a similar, a somewhat similar situation, but without any kind of age restriction. Can I ask? Um, I I don't know if you have access to this information off the top of your research, but um, is there any danger in in, in the city promoting these types of housing units as opposed to duplexes or, you know, the, the more, I don't want to say um, independent, maybe, like more like the micro units where um, you have fully independent, not co-housing and not um, so much, so highly densified that where there's shared space. Um, is there any thought to increase in crime or increase in just, I mean, maybe that's not desirable for people to live in those types of situations, so they would opt for another type. It'd be kind of maybe, 
Am I being clear? I'm just, if, if we were devoted a, a portion of the city to, t say, co-housing, we had a developer come in and make a bunch of co-housing, and people just decided they, that's not their, their thing, um, and they were to have opted to do something more independent, is that, do you see anything going on like that? Is it usually highly occupied? <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm asking a really clear question. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I just, I'm just wondering, because I just... Well, I, I actually have some similar thoughts. It's like when it talks about the micro-housing, I think that's fabulous, and I think that would work really well here in Capitola. I look at the single-room occupancy, and I'm going, I, I don't really see how that works here because there aren't places people would have to go out and eat all their meals out somewhere because there's no kitchen. Um, you know, the, the one behind the house, the apartment, the situation exactly behind my house is one of those. It is a bunch of units that share just basically one. Right, co-housing works for me. I don't have a problem. Well, it's just curious. <laughs> uh, that's why I'm asking what co-housing really means. I, I would clarify that as single room occupancy. So they each have their own room and they share a kitchen. That's what I call But what I heard Ben say is there is no kitchen facility provided in the single room occupancy uh, okay. unit. There's a shared kitchen. Yeah, like a shared kitchen in the single room occupancy. So just as Paul was, it's okay. very similar, right? There's the shared kitchen. Yeah, so with an baths. SRO, there's some sort of shared kitchen and or bathroom facilities. An SRO unit might have a little hot plate, for example, and a toilet, but then the shower is in a shared area, and a more complete kitchen is in a shared area. Okay, so I misunderstood. Yeah. It's slightly better than a dormitory. Depends on how you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I guess my, what my question was is that if this was a, a large section of housing, would it be utilized and enjoyed by the demographic or by the public in Capitola? So right now, someone could come into Capitola and apply for a co-housing project, and they would have their, it could be any of these like townhouse developments we see, and they would just have some aspect of that that's shared. Like they usually have like a garden shed that has shared gardening tools, and then a community center where they share a meal. So very similar. Um, I think one aspect of the co-housing, I know the New Brighton co-housing, it's a condo, so you can actually own your unit and then you're vested in this communal um, aspect of it. And I think at the New Brighton co-housing, you can opt whether or not you want to participate in community dinners or participate. So, but if someone were to come in with a co-housing application today, we wouldn't turn them away. It would be allowed, but it, it's just for the purposes of the code, we could call it out as an allowed use. So, um, Identified. It's identified. Yep. A little okay. more clear. It's more of a promotion thing as opposed to, because that, that's what I keep struggling with as well, is like what in the code forbids any of this? And, and the answer seems to be, well, nothing really. But what we're trying to do is in the housing element show that we are proactive in promoting these kinds of units. Yes, for, the, for some of these. So the... I'm going to get these confused now, but the micro unit, that's correct. We don't have a density limit. A, a developer could come in with these small micro units. They just have to have sleeping accommodations, a kitchen, and a bathroom. And that, you know, that can be one unit. So we don't have any, like, limitations on number of kitchens per, per unit or something currently in the code. That would be controlled perhaps by SoCal Water or something like that, but... We, we do have a limit on how many kitchens you can have, but a unit must have a kitchen. It must have cooking and sleeping facilities. And we don't control the number of those units. So. Correct. Yeah. Except we, we control the number of the units in our multifamily zone. We do not, we have no density limits in our commercial mixed use, but within the multifamily we have a density limit of how many units. So one of the things that's happened in the last years, I, I know there are several buildings in Capitola Village where they had small, sort of very small studio units, 
And all of those units used to provide housing for people who worked in the village, and they've all been converted to vacation rental units. So um, is it possible for us to have some restriction if we built something like, you know, a single room occupancy that it doesn't turn into, you know, places that get rented for vacation rentals? I, I think we, there is multifamily in um, like the Fanmar neighborhood within the, so the only place you can do vacation rental is down in the village. Um, and there is multifamily along the hill over here. So there, we could probably put some standards in there that if you're going to do multifamily. Um, I thought there was a deed restriction that came along with, well, ADUs, right? Now with ADUs, yes. But not. Yeah. But, but it, not we could do something similar probably for SROs. If we wanted to define it and call out like the smaller units could not be rented, but. Um, because I think if we're going to go that route, we want them for housing, not vacation opportunities. Did the uh, deed restriction get removed on the ADUs? Um, just portions of it about owner occupancy. Um, but other than that, there's still deed restrictions on ADUs. So we've, we've moved into... We're discussing these. Should I continue with these? Okay. All right. So uh, micro units. So currently the zoning code is silent on micro units. It would just be treated as um, multifamily or a mixed use if it was part of a um, mixed use project. But there is um, a minimum unit size in the building code that is um, 220 square feet per unit, I believe. Um, and so if the city wanted to do more to promote micro units, um, it could define micro units um, in the zoning code and specifically call it out as an allowed use in certain locations where the city wanted to promote um, smaller units and higher intensity development. So that might be in the CR zoning district um, around the metro, um, for example. Currently, there is no density limitation in CR. So um, you don't have to worry about that, but sort of calling it out um, is, like Commissioner Wilk mentioned, sort of a way to promote this alternative housing type. Um, uh, there may be the need to relax certain development standards um, to accommodate this much higher intensity um, uh, type of housing. Um, and then there's also a question about in the RM zoning districts, are there any locations where the city would want to promote these micro units? And if so, that would require some sort of alternative density standard or an exception to the density standard because these units are so small, they would likely exceed the density um, of the RM zoning district. So we're, we're interested in planning commission Do thoughts. That, that. You'd have to define what a micro unit is somehow. You would need to. Size, I guess. Square feet, I guess. Yeah, I think I think Next it would of so many square feet. I'm sorry. Yes, that's what. Mm -hmm. okay. Why not also in the CC, CR and CC? Why wouldn't we do both? Our thinking is that the CR, because of the mall redevelopment um, and the transit center, becomes sort of the highest intensity area along the 41st Avenue corridor. Okay, and then two more. So live work, currently zoning code is silent on this. I think that if an applicant came in today wanting to have sort of some workspace within um, a residence that the city would treat it as a um, mixed use project and um, zoning wise would be okay. Building code, another story. Um, but if the city wanted to do um, more to promote uh, live work, um, it could be called out as an allow as a permitted use in um, the uh, mixed use and commercial zoning districts. Um, maybe some development standards would meet, need to be adjusted, such as waiving the parking for a non, the non-residential uses, for example. Um, and there might be other development standards that might be need to be adjusted as well if this is a development type that 
the city sees as you know, being desirable and worthy of promotion. And then the last alternative housing type is um, what you might call employee or workforce housing. So an example might be um, an affordable housing project that's reserved for um, uh, employees of the school district, for example. And this sort of housing type, of course, is currently allowed um, in the city. Um, uh, um, but if, again, if the city wanted to do more to sort of promote this sort of thing, that maybe the community benefit program would be a way to do that, to specifically call that out as sort of an available benefit that could be used for um, uh, granting increased intensity. So, so those are the... I, I just have one quick question about the single room occupancy. We had the project for the uh, assisted living on Capitola Road, and basically that was a single room occupancy with a common um, kitchen where they served people meals and stuff, but we were told that does not count as housing. Right? That's correct. Um, that's so. That's a really good point. So the, the one kitchen. It was the fact that the rooms didn't have kitchens. So that's something we should look into um, with this assisted living project. There was one, you know, for cooking for the residents, and if they had added kitchens to each room, they would have counted towards our arena. But they don't count towards the arena because it's more of a. Yeah, in senior housing, they're sort of. You have like more independent living that's clearly a residential use. And then in the continuum of care, you get to more assisted living or skilled nursing, where it becomes more of a um, sort of resident, a, a medical facility that is of a residential na nature. And then that affects the way that the state sort of allows jurisdictions to count them for housing element purposes. And we'll we, we have a few group homes in Capitola, um, like transitional housing, and I, those would count as one unit, not, right. we wouldn't count the be per bedroom. It, so I just want to make certain if we do single room occupants, the, um, that we have units that are going to count toward our housing numbers. Right, we want credit for that. Yeah. yeah. On the workforce, can you go back to the slide a little? I ask one last question about that last point real fast. <laughs> the, um, with the the senior living, especially, this is this is all addressing affordable housing as as it incorporates the middle um, missing middle, right? So would that if with the senior housing that's proposed, he wasn't really suggesting that he's going to be within that bracket of affordability, right? No, there was no. They weren't going to be affordable. No. Right, so it would just count towards Rena. It was just, I wanted to clarify. Yeah, it would not have counted towards Rena, and there was no affordable. So no community benefit over it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> On the um, workforce housing. So just my question around that, would there be then criteria set up for what workforce housing is and like who qualifies for that? Yes, yeah, so um, if, if we were to do something like this, we would clearly define, okay, in order to sort of qualify as a community benefit, um, you would need to do X, Y, and Z things. So we would define exactly what that means. But limited to SoCal Unified. No, 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 that's just meant as an example. Um, it could be other, other types of employee workforce housing. And if the Planning Commission is interested in this, we would sort of work out some of those details and bring that back to you for further discussion. Not to belabor that, but um, what's the enforcement of something like that? I mean, I mean, somebody's right at that threshold and then they get a step raise and now they're, you know, how does that, how have you seen that work in the past? Yeah, I was gonna say, this is really tied to the place that they work and not their income level. I mean, it'd be, it'd be great to get something with a school district or, um, but it would be tied to the workforce. So it's okay if, they're, if their pay is higher, it's really looking at trying to decrease the BMTs and have a local workforce live close by. So it's not so much an incentive for affordability as it is to like to have people live close to where they work. 
So this would be some sort of promotional thing where, like, for example, if it was the SoCal school district, the so as as part of their hiring practices or whatever, they would say there is this promotional opportunity that we've dealt with the city of Capitola to provide teacher housing and you know, and here here's the program, here's for sure how it all works, and you know, and that's recruiting uh, opportunity for them. Is that yeah, how we're I think imagining school districts this? view, you know, subsidize housing as a, a very important feature of um, recruitment and retention strategy in hiring. Okay. It, but when the mall development came in in 2019, there there was discussion about can you provide workforce housing? There were a couple council members that were interested in that. So we did have some discussions actually with uh, SoCal Unified Elementary, um, I think a couple of the local hospitals, as well as um, Cabrillo College to see if they'd be interested. And it's it becomes a partnership where the school, say if it was Cabrillo, is actually like investing in the mall development into an apartment building for their employees. So there's an exchange of money and they become the the landlord essentially and, and so if you were to include this as part of the housing element would you have to pre-coordinate any of that um to, to convince the acd that yeah we've told we reached out to the hospitals and school board and and they've shown some interest and it's i mean i'm just wondering how well other or, communities are doing there was a uh, even on the radio this morning santa clara was crowing about how they did this and they're on their third teacher Housing project third in one county. The county basically is exactly what you're saying. The county owns, I believe they own or they're leasing the facility and then they're turning around leasing back to the school district. Mm -hmm. So I don't think HCD is going to complain if we do this. I think it's really going to help them. Personally. I'm just trying to understand it. Really incentivize them. Okay. Yeah, that, that's what we're trying to get at is do we want to, one, do we, do we like this idea? And two, to make it, um, economically viable, do we want to incentivize it? So for the example of the mall, they're going to want to get the highest and best use out of that property when they uh, build their housing. But if we incentivize this somehow, uh, that there's more incentive for local workforce housing, then they might, they might engage in the conversation if it works out for their bottom line. And there's new state regulations around the school districts, and they can build on their properties, but this gives another opportunity. I saw the MGP letter where they were complaining about our insistence on all this you know, affordable housing stuff. Well, this is one way to sort of around that because it's not necessarily affordable housing, even though that is, because the county or the, the school district or whatever is basically paying for it. It's one way to sort of get around that. So it's a relatively easy thing to sort of. I don't know if your mic is picking up. Is it? I mean, I think it's. Yeah. I think it's a good way to, to incentivize MGP to add some of this to that mall project. Personally, I think that would be good. We got another question on a different topic. Okay. Is, um, I think for this one, am I seeing support? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's the other topic? The live work. work. So um, you're talking about um, in commercial. Uh, not requiring a commercial use permit now to have someone work in their home, at least start an auto shop in their garage, and now that's just okay. No, <laughs> not yet. So we wouldn't set it up that way. Um, that would be a home occupancy permit. So if you're thinking of a single family home, someone's doing a shop out of their garage, and they're working within the the rules and regulations for home occupancy, that that's your single family home. This is more live work would be multifamily. Um, it's actually like allowed right now within our commercial zone as mixed use, but we would be defining it and possibly one, one, one advantage I would suggest if we were to do a live work in our mixed use zones is to acknowledge that the people that live there work there and we would allow a decrease in parking because they're not because we typically we would calculate the square footage of the commercial area, the square footage of the residential, and count it all twice. But if it's a true live work, you 
decrease the overall parking and that would be the one incentive in the zone. But this is essentially allowed. I One question for the Planning Commission would be, would you want this? Um, I don't think you would want live work in your multifamily zones. You wouldn't want to introduce commercial into areas where you have multifamily. So give me an example again of, of the live work. You have a multifamily, but there'd be a common, what, laundry or something? What? Have you been to the tannery in Santa Cruz? The tannery yes. right off of Highway 9? There's a dance studio. There's art studios. And then the, uh, most of those units that are there, the artists work at the tannery. And, or a, a certain percentage, I think, of those units are live work. Uh, the sort of traditional live work is an artist's loft where an artist lives in the space and it's also the artist's workspace as well. Okay. And um, it differs from, say, a home occupation in that there could be more commercial activity going on there, such as sort of customers come into the home. And so would you or would you not need a uh, commercial use permit to create that live work tannery or whatever it is. You would need a commercial permit at the tannery because they, they, there they have actual galleries. The public can come in and buy goods. They also have like dance studios and teach dance lessons. So you would be required to have a, a business license. Theaters, they have theaters, yep. I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, some very noisy or obtrusive uh, business that, uh, you know, an artist or a dance studio may be very, you know, sound great, but like I say, if it's an auto shop with a guy or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to explore the edges of this. Yeah, you know, there's, there's permutations here in what you could do. You could um, continue to require a CUP for this use. Mm -hmm. um, but like Katie was um, explaining, sort of waive the parking um, for the non-residential use just to remove some of the barriers to this. So if we, yeah, so if we were to do that, but still require the CUP, so it would come before us and we could say, oh, well, wait a minute, no, this isn't what we had in mind. We could still deny that. Yes. Would that be administratively then? We could set it up as a conditional use permit so it wouldn't be administrative. I guess my feeling is we we got a lot of things you have to do, and the op, uh, probability of us turning, you know, making our own tannery row is probably pretty low. I would focus on other things personally. I couldn't see that in our AMSEC area. Well, also, we have in our code that if you have a mixed use project, we allow you to do a study to say if the parking should decrease. This is just kind of a way to check a box, but it's not really necessary. Yeah, you know, Katie and I have had some discussions about this, and I share with her my perspective that's, I think, similar to Commissioner Estes, that, you know, live work is probably not a housing type that's sort of really ideally suited to Capitola, and there might be some other alternative housing types, such as smaller units, that would be more appropriate. That said, it's still an allowed use. And so if somebody did decide, you know, they really wanted to do a live work project in the mixed use zoning district, it's still a possibility um, under existing rules. In terms of affordability, I remember going over when we were talking about the housing element before that the developers are beholden to a 50 year commitment. Is that correct? Am I remembering that right? Or is that not? That completely for affordable housing. Yeah, they're um, if they're proposing intensified, you know, um, density and height limits and all this stuff, they're only beholden to fifty years of providing affordable housing. I believe it's fifty-five years or the life of the building, so oh. it it's longer. So whatever's whatever comes first, kind of thing. I think a lot depends on their funding source. Yeah. Yeah. I was curious. I was just wondering if it Yeah, we updated that recently when we updated the inclusionary housing ordinance and we tried to align things, but it is a lot of it is tied back to funding sources. And I think now um, a lot of the loans are set for.
for there for the affordable. So I don't want to. I don't want to waste time going deeper into it. But I just was. I, maybe I'll, I'll. An example of that is the Dakota Apartments. They're just about to hit their thirty years. Mm -hmm. um, they're coming back in for a rehab project in which we'll get another 30, 30 years of affordability by oh. working with them on this rehab project. But a lot of those things are tied to the original development agreements for the, the developments that we have in Capitola currently. Okay, so this new is development is 55. Okay. okay, thank you. And so I think to kind of summarize, I think some of the themes that we've heard so far, so interest in Promoting employee workforce housing through the community benefit program seems interest in that. Live work, maybe nothing's needed in the zoning code right now since it's already allowed. Um, micro units, some interest in defining that as a distinct use type and um, allowing that or encouraging it in certain locations, such as around the transit center. Um, yeah, on that one, we didn't close on should we allow that in RM. Uh, yes. So I think we should discuss that because that could be an incentive to populate more of our lots that are in the RM zones. Yeah. If we relax the development standards. I think it'll, um, depending on how high you go with the densities and your high density, um, but you could you could incent if you want even more because you allow micro units that that would be that next thing right. so yep. that's what I was thinking mm. <clears throat> micro belongs near transit micro is typically tied towards decreasing parking requirements because they're so small that usually you wouldn't have two people living in a mm -hmm. micro. Um, so I think if we were to set up a true ordinate like incentive for micros it should be near our transit center, so near the mall, if we were to go that direction. Multifamily, maybe within a certain distance of Metro, there's quite a bit of multifamily north of Capitola Road. Um, yeah, that it might the area work. I was thinking of along Clare, south of, southwest, whatever, of Clare Street, between Clare's and Capitola Road, that area. Should be close to, or it is close to this new transit center. Mm -hmm. Whether that be in this design, I would like to see it located, sort of tied into the transit center going into start. Um, doesn't mean we can't ultimately uh, change it and say we want to have it in, you know, the multi-residential zones. But right now, for me, I would want to start sort of in the mall area within a certain radius of the transit center, which would take in part of Capitola. I mean, you could take in part of Capitola Road. You could have, you know, a distance from the transit center, not on the mall property. Okay. I agree. With that. Yeah. I think we've already increased the density in, in RM, right? We talked about that in terms of the um, middle housing, mm -hmm. mid housing. So if we're already increasing density around Clear Street, Allowing that mm -hmm. to step in that direction, and if we focus the micro housing just a closer, like, like Mr. Westman saying, closer to the transit center, then we we've got it covered. It's right here. I know. Right I don't understand it's why. Microphone's okay. fault, not mine. <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> um. So I'm hearing close to the transit center for now, increased densities in the multifamily zones. Okay. Um, in terms of, do we go to SRO? Single room occupancy. So this is typically your group housing and it wouldn't count towards our arena. We don't think, you know, I think it's per, you have to have a kitchen. I'm not a big fan of the SROs right now in Capitola. I think, you know, the micro housing would sort of fill that niche for us. Um, uh, how, out of curiosity, how is the city attaining or getting Rena um, with the junior ADUs as the, do they, are they counted 
towards Rena if people bring in like a detached and a junior because the junior and EUs don't necessarily need to have a full kitchen. They could have a very simplified, you know, hot plate and and that's counted. So I mean, if if we're talking about an SRO with they could have a hot plate potentially that it's that's allowed. I mean, if it's not necessarily specified, I just don't understand why it wouldn't count towards that as in terms of a benefit and incentivize for for cities. Yeah, I guess um, no. we could draft it so it meets the requirement for RENA, but it doesn't, I don't know if that really. Yeah, I would really... want to research a little bit more because I think SRO is sometimes a broad term. There might be certain types of SROs that you can get um, on it that you can count, but maybe others you might want to look at. It would, it would just seem like a shame if we had a big development of SRO and then we didn't get anything for it. it. Just seems kind of silly. So we'll look into that. Okay. And co-housing, it's basically allowed. Do do we want to spend some time on that or not really? Uh, I don't see that we really need to. I don't know how much benefit you think we would get by listing it separately. I mean, if you think HCD is going to love it if we list it separately, then I don't care if you list it separately. But uh, just don't think if you don't need to, don't. Okay. Maybe we list it in like the definition of multifamily, including co-housing. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think is essentially what the city of Santa Cruz Ready to move on to the third topic? <laughs> All right, so parking. So the housing element says a few things about parking. Uh, one, of the, one of the things it says is that parking standards have the potential to constrain development or limit density on a site due to the cost of constructing parking facilities and space limitations. So on the screen here is a table of existing on-site parking requirements. And so for single family dwellings, it ranges from two to four units, depending on the size of units. For ADUs and SB9 units, it's limited to one per unit under state law. For duplexes, two per unit, one covered. And for multi-family dwellings, 2.5 per unit, one covered. So existing on-site parking requirements for residential uses. <laughs> Program 1.6 in the housing element says that the city's parking requirements for multifamily housing do not vary by size of the unit, potentially constraining the development of smaller units and discouraging higher density. And then the program says that the city will revise the multifamily residential parking requirement based on the unit size or number of bedrooms and will also revise the current covered parking requirement for multifamily development. And it goes on to say um, to review, review and revise as appropriate parking requirements in general to remove constraints to housing. Um, and then also to include reduced parking standards for senior and special need housing. Some of that is dictated by state law. So uh, this past year, there were some new state laws adopted um, related to parking. Uh, the first one um, says that if there is an addition or a renovation to a single family home, cities cannot um, uh, require additional on-site parking. So this is new. So this will affect Capitola. Um, and then the other um, law is that um, uh, there's certain types of shared parking. So shared parking means if you have say a commercial and a residential use uh, on a site, that those uses share the parking because the parking demand occurs at different times of the day, like office and housing. Um, Capitola currently has shared parking provisions in the code where the planning commission has the discretion to approve shared parking. Um, what AB 894 says is that um, in certain circumstances, cities must allow shared parking if it meets certain criteria. So there's gonna need to be, I think a few small amendments to your shared parking provisions uh, to uh, address AB 894. So um, here is a table, let's see if I can do this again. So here's a table showing what some of your neighboring communities require with on-site parking. So in Santa Cruz, um, 
the um, parking is uh, is dictated by the number of bedrooms. So one space per, per, per unit for a studio or one bedroom, and then two per unit for um, a two plus bedroom. Scott, what does that asterisk mean at the bottom? Uh, that means that in, in Santa Cruz's housing element, that they make a statement that they aim to eliminate parking minimum citywide by January 2028. So city of Capitola, um, want, I'm sorry, city of Santa Cruz says in its housing element that it wants to eliminate parking minimums um, within the next five years. And so this um, slide, I won't go through each one, but sort of gives a little bit con of context of what mm -hmm. um, other local cities are requiring um, in terms of their on-site parking for townhomes and multifamily. So it seems like our choice is either to go size or bedrooms. Yes. Mm -hmm. We could be Santa Cruz and eliminate it. <laughs> Are they just hoping that it'll even itself out? Just that over the span of <laughs> like just densifying and then it'll just be like, nah, everybody will figure it out. I mean, well, it's interesting. So that state law that just came out um, that says you, um, you if you do an addition to a home, so in the past, whenever someone does an addition to the home, we'd require if it goes above a certain uh, threshold of square feet, that they have to provide the parking, and that's by state law, we can no longer require additional parking. Um, so really thinking about what are what do we want to tie these to so that we get parking spaces on the on the site. But you're seeing here, most of them are a maximum of one to two spaces other than Watsonville. So. And this is including in the coastal zone, the, the that state law? Because I think for ADUs, we were saying that we still had to preserve one on-site parking spot within the program. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I'll double-check that. I didn't notice any coastal zone exemption, but we should double-check Yeah, we'll double-check that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Trouble if you go with bedrooms, then you have to decide what a bedroom is. Exactly. I, was I think our, our recommendation on this is to go by size rather than bedroom, so you don't have to worry about size. It. Makes sense to me. So here here's um, a table with some potential parking adjustments to the parking. Um, we've highlighted the parking requirement for single family dwellings because um, you know I think because of the new state law, uh, we th we're thinking it. it it might be um, um, pre uh, preferential to have just a two per unit requirement, regardless of size, um, to avoid people gaming the system. And then with uh, ADUs and SB9s, that's all dictated by state law, so no change there, no change for duplexes. And then on multifamily, you know, I think our recommendation would be to tie it to floor area rather than bedroom, so you don't run into this problem of having to determine what's a bedroom and what's not. And the numbers um, that we have up here for us sort of feel about right, given what other communities are doing in the area. And, um, but that's, of course, open to sort of discussion. Uh, just out of curiosity, what's the rationale for requiring covered? That's what I was going to ask. I don't think there's any good rationale. I don't think there's any good rationale for requiring covered. I think most covered parking in Capitola is not used for parking, unless it's in the flood zone <laughs> under the house. <laughs> most cities do it for aesthetic reasons. Yeah. Um, and and we don't have a garage credit in terms of our standard design or our design standards. So it's if we create a covered parking space, it takes away living space essentially, right? Yeah, there's a floor area for a small lot. There's an exception. Oh. Um, a floor, like if you have a lot that's below a certain size, we give you additional floor area towards your garage. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's 250 square feet, I think, of garage space. So we could propose eliminating the required covered parking. Or yeah, that, I would love that feedback tonight of whether or not you think it's appropriate to remove the covered parking standard. Oh, and a lot of this you end up seeing at the apartment buildings. 
are these really long carports, and I don't know that they're really protecting the cars from right. much other than falling trees, but. I could go with no covered parking requirement. And then a flat. I don't see a need for covered parking. I, want, I, I think this is a pretty good start, this chart up here for parking requirements, just eliminate the covered. Mm -hmm. And then just having a flat requirement for two two spaces, uncovered, mm -hmm. covered, whatever. Yeah. yeah. For the large. If you want to provide covered, you can. If you don't. Mm -hmm. And then for anything over twenty uh, 2,000 feet, we're just requiring two spaces. I could live with it. Yeah. It seems. Over 2,000 or over? Well, 2006, or well, over 2,000, instead of being three spaces, three per unit, it'll just be two per unit. Yeah. So and over 2,600, it'll just be, instead of four per unit, it'll just be two per unit. I think that. Okay. Do, do you want to create something in the um, Multifamily dwelling, we've got one per less than 500 square feet, I think, for micro. And if we've got, if micro is tied to transit, would you want to see it less than one space per micro unit? Micro is tied to transit, yeah. So a micro that's within a certain distance of transit could be a, like 0. 0.5? Yeah. 0.5, isn't that what we had at 4401 Capitola, right? Mm -hmm. That's how they... That seems appropriate. Also, there's a section in our code currently that I think that we could, well, I can't remember exactly, but it's um, if you're within a certain proximity to a bus stop, you can reduce your parking requirement or I can't remember how it's said. It's been a while. It's, it's state law. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about it a lot with the ADUs mm -hmm. and SB9 that if you're within a quarter mile of a high frequency transit that you don't have to provide parking. There's, um, but... We don't have those. We don't have high frequency. What's the finest high frequency? Um, having has to come intervals every 15 minutes during peak periods. But that's what Metro's doing right now. Metro's headed there. They're, yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they're trying. They're trying. They're not there yet. Well, I mean, their goal is this year. Yeah, I thought we were, they were going to get there this year at the mall. They're, we're expecting within this housing element this next cycle for it to happen and um you know once they get bus on the bus lane on the highway i could see this getting us closer but right now they're not quite there so i'll be shocked if they get there <laughs> yeah no i mean it's just it's pretty highly publicized that that's their goal to be there this year for 15 minutes so for I don't I don't think they're even proposing that they will be that way at every bus stop. I think they're saying that at the transit center they might meet that requirement, but not everybody's going to be within a quarter mile of the transit center. Right. You ask about bus stops, at, you know, the quarter mile from bus stops, but it's not going to happen a quarter mile from most bus stops. Well, and that brings me to <laughs> what I think it came up with that application that was um, on uh, 47th. The, I can't remember the name. Of the 4401 yes. Cap Road. Thank you. The, um, the people were asking, like, what it doesn't mean, even though there's 0.5 parking spaces per unit that they're allowing, it doesn't guarantee that people aren't just going to have, you know, three cars to their name. I mean, that's not something we can necessarily control. But um, is that is that something we can necessarily control? Nothing, no. It's just yeah. The landlord can control it on the site. Yeah. The city can't control it other than making them move their, their cars around. Right. So then that, I mean, are we going to, maybe it's a question for another day, just the regulation of parking up in those areas seems... Like even by Jade Street, it just seems so impacted all the time. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, thank you. Okay, have we reached consensus on this one? Thank you for patience. I think so. <laughs> and I th uh, sorry, but okay. just to go back. So the 4401 Cap Road, the Planning Commission did ask us to 
bring up to um, our public works director as well as city council, making them aware that the planning commission is interested in looking at the avenues up there and re looking at how the parking's designed to possibly get more parking to fit. So I think that is something on our long list of um, improvement projects for Capitola. So that was heard during that review and it's definitely on a list. Whether or not it becomes a priority in the next year or in five years is um, up to the city council. But yeah, you're welcome. And so the housing element also calls for the city to make some uh, adjustments to parking requirements for certain special needs housing types. And some of this is dictated by state law. I don't know if we need to sort of belabor it tonight, um, but on the table is sort of what we were thinking with senior housing to sort of distinguish between independent living and sort of elderly and long-term care in terms of what the parking requirement is to sort of tie it more to the nature of the use. Um, let's see, with um, group housing, one per unit, get rid of the guest space requirement. For residential care, um, one per three beds. Uh, for emergency shelters and transitional housing and religious in institutional uses, these are um, parking requirements that are dictated by state law, so we would just follow what the requirement is for them. So again, this we would bring this back to you. You could look at it, look at, it at a future date with a finer tooth comb. Yeah. I, I will say for myself, as I go to a lot of these facilities um, and as a hospice volunteer, and whether it's ages in APDOS, whether it's Pacific Manor here in Capitola, or almost any of them, the hardest thing is to find a place to park. I mean, you always end up as a volunteer parking in the neighborhood around it, because none of them have enough parking. So I do think these kinds of places need to have some provisions for because there are always a lot of visitors there but I know we have to follow state law now this seems like a natural result of something that I just can see coming a big ominous star cloud <laughs> is it okay to, to move on from this okay great um and then a few other little changes. Um, we need to uh, implement state law about the no additional parking for a remodel project. But if we're changing the single family parking requirement to two, regardless of size, then um, we don't need to worry about that. And then also a few tweaks, I think, to the shared parking provisions um, uh, pursuant to AB 894. Okay. All right, so the second to last topic before we talk about um, massing is lot consolidation. So um, I think as you know, lot consolidation means if you have a development site with two or more lots as part of the development project, um, you reduce the lot, sometimes merging all of them together into one big lot um, so that the development becomes more feasible um, from a physical perspective, but also you then have it under single ownership. So um, it, development is facilitated due to that. So here's just an example of lot consolidation. So a project 4401 Capitola Road, there was two parcels um, as part of the development project. They merged those two parcels into one parcel for the entire development site um, to accommodate the development project. So the housing element uh, addresses lot consolidation and it calls for the city to develop incentives to encourage lot consolidation and then identifies some strategies that might be used, such as ministerial approval of lot line adjustments and flexible development standards for large sites. So the housing element does um, go into some sort of depth in its discussion of the lot consolidation issues, particularly related to some of the sites, the non-vacant sites um, that are identified um, as opportunity sites. So here's the map of um, uh, what the housing element calls a consolidated site analysis. So it identifies all of the sites um, where there are uh, multiple parcels that are part of sort of a larger um, development opportunity site area. And some of them are under single ownership. In fact, most of them are in, under single ownership. 
but some of them are under um, have multiple owners. And I think the single ownership sites are fine. We don't need to worry about that. Um, if the owner, as part of a development project, the owner will merge the parcels and there's nothing the city really needs to do to encourage or incentivize that. Um, I think it's in the cases where you have um, fragmented ownership of these contiguous parcels where there is a role for the city to come in and try to encourage or incentivize lot consolidation. And so there's really three of those areas right now that are identified in the housing element. There's um, on Bay Street, it's zone CC. Um, these two parcels are under um, different ownership. At the corner of 41st and Bromer, there are three parcels um, that have multiple owners that are identified opportunity sites. And then here, Capitola Avenue, um, just north of the Bay Avenue intersection, those um, are separate owners as well. So the question then becomes, okay, well, what can the city do to incentivize lot consolidation? And um, in its guidance to cities and their housing element, HCD identifies a number of tools, things like deferring fees, expediting permit processes, um, adjusting development standards, um, actually devoting financial resources to these projects um, and other um, incentives such as increasing allowable density um, lot coverage and floor area ratio where lot, lot consolidation occurs. Um, sort of there are other tools that cities can use beyond what HCD um, identifies. Some cities will sort of designate specific area, areas where lot cons consolidation is either encouraged or required in some form. So contributing financial resources to incentivize um, lot consolidation and maybe investing infrastructure improvements in certain areas. And some of these things fall outside of the zoning code, not really something for us to think about now, but others are um, tools that can be uh, incorporated into the zoning regulations. So, um, you know, I think to incentivize lot consolidation on opportunity sites where there's fragmented ownership, um, I think one of the things that the city can do in its zoning code is to sort of just allow increased intensity um, for a project that consolidates lots. Because I think that, you know, to maximize the development potential of housing, including affordable housing on these sites with fragment, fragmented ownership, I think the city does want to see lot consolidation because um, more units will be um, possible. So what does that look like? So for example, in the MUN district for these two sites, without lot consolidation, um, or any kind of community benefits, what's allowed currently is an FAR of one um, and a height of 27 feet. But if a project were to come in, say, with lot consolidation and community benefits to really maximize the development potential of this opportunity site, the city would, could say, okay, now you're allowed an FAR of 1.5 and additional height. So that's how that might work. And then similarly on, um, these other sites in the CC district currently, maximum FAR of 1.0 and height of 40 feet um, to uh, incentivize lot consolidation. The city could say, okay, if you consolidate lots and you provide some degree of community benefits, you're allowed additional FAR of 1.5 and a height of 50. So, um, you know, there- These only for residential projects? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, that, that's the whole, intent of this is to uh, maximize the um, development of these opportunity sites for housing and specifically for more affordable or attainable housing. So I would, I would think that, yes, that would be the case. This is also, I should mention, um, one area that we're continuing to work on with HCD. Uh, they, were, they had concerns about the sites that aren't owned by the same Folks, so we might have more information coming out to you in the next couple of weeks as our housing group is working on. on this is one other area that we have to massage a little bit. Yeah, like the, the non-vacant sites with multiple owners, I think HC is really kind of doubting the realistic development potential. Yeah, there, there's a chance that we might actually remove these from our inventory if necessary because 
of their questioning how we're going to go about this. So as you saw, a lot of the incentives are like tied to money, which the city doesn't really, you know, we've kind of got limited funds in order right. to, to help that way. But um, this is one idea is, but, but it would have to be tied to really strict standards of like producing the arena on site, something like that in order to get that extra FAR in height. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. How, how would you write the code <laughs> to make it happen, right? It's pretty hard. Yeah, sort of we would, we would identify qualifying projects with objective criteria and I think sort of meeting certain. Specifically call them out. Yeah. Like you called the potential hotels called that. Yep, okay. yep. So under the community benefit zone, we would have a separate section for lot consolidations with multiple property owners. If it makes the state happy and it only takes a few hours to write it up, sure. I don't think it's going to happen. I think you're right. <laughs> At a future time, though, until the next round of declared sites, if you got them to yeah. do it over the next year. We would check a box. We check. Mm -hmm. Okay, so general support for that? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, then our last topic. So, um, uh, topic of massing, um, I think where Katie asked me to focus on uh, a couple of specific issues. Um, so, in the pre 2020 zoning code, before the major zoning code update was adopted in 2020, um, uh, all covered open space areas below a roof eave, um, I'm sorry, all covered open space and areas be below a roof eave over two feet count it towards the FAR. Um, with the zoning code update, that was changed so that these areas um, are now excluded from the FAR calculation. And so I think that the, the concern of this rule change or a concern of this rule change is that when you combine this with um, floodplain requirements to elevate living area, that's going to encourage top-heavy buildings, sort of maybe similar to the photographs um, that you see here. Um, and uh, Katie also asked planning commissioners to provide photos related to this topic of massing. Commissioner Wilk submitted these photos, which we've included in the presentation. Um, and um, another sort of narrowly focused issue related to massing is um, in the zoning code, uh, uh, interior area of a building with a floor to ceiling height of greater than 16 feet is counted twice in the floor area calculation is the rule. And I think as you remember from the recent 605 Escalona project, um, there might be ways to kind of game this um, rule in a way that um, uh, you enclose sort of a large roof truss in a way that keeps the floor to ceiling height less than six feet, but the visible massing of this building element um, is greater than 16 feet. Uh, so that may be a concern. So I think there's sort of, sort of two um, uh, sort of targeted massing related amendments that um, we've been thinking related to these issues. One is to sort of go back to the old way um, of including covered open space and roof eave over two feet in the FIR calculation. Um, another would be to uh, include in the FAR, FAR calculation areas with sort of flu, floor to rooftop height of greater than 16 feet um, uh, to count that twice. Um, uh, as opposed to ceiling height, which is the current rule. So um, oh, that's it. So that's sort of all I had to say on the subject. Katie, do you have anything to add on the massing issue? No. Well, yeah. One one thing to add. If we could go to that slide, uh, just about the two feet overhang. So, for architectural features, it is nice to have a nice roof overhang. It adds a lot to a building. Um, your typical craftsman has a really nice roof overhang. So maybe if two, but what we're seeing, we've seen a couple of examples where the image on the left 
it's a really large roof overhang. It's not quite a carport. A carport would cover would would count. Um, and so it's just should that count? Is that does that add to the massing of the structure for you? In the past, we would have counted that. So that's that overhang. I'm going to say is eight to ten feet on the um, there. And so in the past, we would have counted that. So you wouldn't have such a large projection coming out. And then, but if if it was turned into a deck, how does that fit into it? Because then you have walls that go up and. Yeah, so if it was turned into a deck, it, it, definition of mm -hmm. what is a roof overhang. And, and also, I mean, all that space, if we're, talk, if we're talking about floodplains, all that space beneath that, the two foot over, the greater than two foot overhang is virtually unusable. I mean, except for a carport, but, or commercial space, but the, I would think it'd be a shame to underutilize that 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 area underneath. I mean, it's it doesn't seem to be a deck because we have limitations on decks that would then limit your FAR. So I mean, but like a green roof could be an overhang, like if they planted that whole thing. Um, it just would seem to be a shame to limit that. That, that modulation from the street, taking advantage of all the floodplain area or the base flood elevation underneath. Um, I just, I mean. Um, yeah, so in your in your floodplain, I think you all are aware of this, but your condition space is limited. You can have a garage on the first floor. You can have commercial on the first floor. But in terms of living space, um, you, you have to get that space out of the floodplain. So we've seen some projects, actually the, the most recent approval across the street, the bedroom on the first floor was elevated, I wanna say two feet to get it out of the floodplain. But in some, some circumstances closer to the river, your first story is really limited in terms of probably a garage for a future redevelopment or just storage area with no heat. And then once you get into the second story, so we will see as, as uh, homes are redeveloped in the floodplains, people aren't going to want to put that much of their floor area into the first story. They're going to want to elevate it. And so I think the big question here is um, that top heavy massing, do you want us to put more controls on it? Because right now we're cantilevers. We, we wouldn't count that towards the, mass, the massing of the building. So how do you define massing? It sounds like you're defining massing in terms of overhangs and ratio of first to second floor. To me, massing is like flat roofs with giant buildings that loom over your neighbors and you know block the light from the neighborhood. And it's building volume, I would say, in my in my in my view, the the building volume on the on the upper story is greater than the building volume down below. And, and so I think I'm just confused if you're not going to use the building volume on the upper story and you're in a floodplain, how do you utilize your living space except for building in a stack? So you're saying that massing in your definition is using your floor area ratio up high as opposed to low. Well, you, you can't really utilize the floor area ratio down below because there's no living space allowed within that flood area. Yeah, I understand that. I'm just trying to understand, trying to get definitions here because. Yeah. So is is the question we're talking about now massing, or are we talking about just the floor air? How we calculate floor area ratio? How we calculate floor area ratio relative to the two foot? Do we want to bring that back to avoid? Uh, these scenarios where the second story is cantilevered over the first story. I don't have a problem with the cantilever story cantilevered over the first story. No, I mean it's it's the only practical thing they can do given they're in the floodplain, right? They want to get the living space. I guess question: are, This is only in the floodplain we're talking. No, this would apply citywide. Right, so we're focusing on the floodplain, but then we can take this example up to Clifford Heights, right? 
Yes. And in the floodplain, you know, uh, recently we approved a variance to floor area to allow a double a, a, a double garage um, for just this reason. It, it made sense to allow, you know, allow for a two-car garage that didn't count towards the floor area knowing that they needed the, the living space above. I remember also um, with the old code when they had, um, like, porches. That was not necessarily cantilevered, but it was, you know, it had posts with or without posts that would count towards the FAR. And that was a challenge to try and incorporate, you know, amenable uh, outdoor areas on the first level uh, with overhangs that wouldn't count towards FAR. And so then just any, given the constraints of the small lots in Capitola, I just, I'm, my my opinion at least is conserving that FAR that we are allowed to distribute it amongst the bathrooms, the kitchens, the living spaces, the bedrooms, are every square inch is important. And it and eliminating those, whether it be um, well, especially for just empty overhangs, I feel like the overhangs create architectural modulation and really add character. Depending, I mean, it could be modern, it can be craftsman, it could be traditional. It, it just adds character to every single house. Um, and, if you, and if you constrain that overhang, you're going to get these big block houses where they're just maximizing everything they can. You know? So can we be a little more uh, fine-tuned and have regulations that are for the floodplain area? Uh, because it seemed like on the house that we approved um, across the street, that you know that was raising that elevation of the bedroom two feet. That was not really significant, and a lot of you know that happens in a lot of places. When you start talking about having a floodplain elevation that's ten feet, then that's a whole different scenario than the majority of Capitola is in. I mean, there's really only a small area where the flood regulations are that significant. So I wonder if we can have, you know, something that talks about homes that are in a floodplain area, uh, you know, and have rules for those that are different than what they are in other parts of town. Because I don't think you would want to see this applied like on Cliffwood Heights. Uh, you know, having sort of the top-heavy house up there, um, you know, in that kind of neighborhood doesn't seem like it works. Um, well, but, yeah. but so, but it does cover porches, and porches are used a lot in in um, you know a number of different design, Victorian-style houses, craftsman-style houses, and they're that's scattered around. all over the place. And that's supposed to be the unique culture of Capitola we're trying to preserve. So if we now force people to eliminate porches because they want living space, you are going to end up with a lot of Silicon Valley like block homes, in my opinion. I, I, but I think we changed our zoning ordinance to allow people to have porches without counting it in the floor area ratio. Uh, yeah. And so I think there are a lot of things we can do, you know, when we, when we start sort of trying to pass these rules that apply to the entire town because there's a problem with the houses that are in the floodplain, I don't think we're doing the whole community a real good service. It seems to me that we can be sophisticated enough that we can come up with regulations that deal with that specific problem. And then, you know, we can talk about exactly how we want to calculate floor area ratios in, you know, the rest of the community. I would add to that that you know, I, I do think the way in which that last application was reviewed and that we applied a variance is the correct way to utilize a variance. Variances are tied to the property right. and the circumstances of the property. So this one, if, if we want to do something just tied to the floodplain, I, I believe the variance is actually the right tool for that because you really do want to look at those properties instance by instance rather than I, I would worry that we would create just another issue by trying to <laughs> draft up just for the floodplain. Okay. We can look into it. We'll def we'll we'll look into it and bring it back for discussion. But 
And I absolutely think you're correct. I think uh, those people that are in the floodplain could be entitled to a variance because, you know, the rules are that there's something unusual about, you know, the size, shape, or topography of the lot and, you know, not being able to build because of the topography in the floodplain is a valid reason for granting a variance in those situations. Yeah. We actually, we recently received a new application that also takes a similar approach of just leaving the garage on the first story and all the living will be on the second. Um, so you'll, that'll be coming in the floodplain, in, the floodplain. Yeah, in Riverview. So, and that one, the floodplain is much higher than what we saw across the street. Yeah. Um, in, in, if this does come back around, I think showing um, a different, like I understand the principle in showing these photos, th those two especially, in terms of massing, but showing, um, look, there's one for sale with a huge porch. There's another, you know, just any type of entrance overhangs of different varieties and different um, architecture, I think is applicable to this. And the, I think communicating these types of buildings shows um, kind of a, a narrow view of this type of massing, because it could be applicable to, you know, and you know, little portals going into homes of any variety. <laughs> okay. So can somebody explain what we're going to do? <laughs> so so I'm, I'm hearing sort of a diversity of opinions on this issue, um, uh, and in, including the concern that going back to the old rule may discourage um, architectural features that create visual interests and is consistent with the Capitola character. And so I think what Katie and I will do is maybe explore some ways to sort of address this top heavy building massing concern while also um, not discouraging um, these architectural features and um, maybe bring something back that tries to do both of those things um, for further discussion. Right, because I do like the idea of, you know, front porches and some of those things not counting in the floor area ratio because they do add to the character and style of the home. And I think we could come up with a legitimate list of those kinds of things. The thing that, again, I'll bring it back, the thing that bothers me about the top-heavy uh, buildings is the daylight planes for the neighbors, the specific ones on Capitola um, Avenue here, where there's, on Riverview, there's these tiny little bungalows, and all of a sudden there's these giant buildings looming over them, and they've lost all their light. It's like, what happened to my mornings? So I, I would think that we could do something in terms of daylight, like we have in the village, right? We have daylight planes. That's why we have roof, uh, you know, um, you know, I don't. And... I don't think our daylight plane was in our code when this one went through planning commission. But it, it, for the most recent application next door, we have the daylight plane. I'd have to go back and check, but I don't think because it's in the coastal zone, it didn't take effect until 2021. So, yeah, this this wasn't subject to the daylight plane. It'd be really interesting. We could actually come back and show you what the daylight plane what would have been cut out of this if it were subject to that but so because now we do have a standard that in mixed use neighborhood if you're adjacent to residential you have to have that daylight plane that's good yeah <laughs> um also with the massing um the enclosed ceiling spaces that circumvent rule intent um I remember there was an application a while back with the Depot Hill, um, the the seventy two foot chimney and the I can't remember it was on cliff. Anyway, they their proposal we granted a variance because they proposed dropping the ceiling down to mid span of the double hung windows to meet that requirement, and I just I, f I feel like it was so such a silly proposal, you know, but. I, because after we met, when I was listening to all the different um, 
comments for this, the, the really high ceilings. I, I, I see the point. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Um, the only thing that I think that this would be applicable, the disadvantage would be like a stairwell or something being counted, you know, all the way to the top if you had some type of large um, area, top to bottom for climbing stairs. We don't. No, we don't. We changed that. Stair, stair we did. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, is there, is there, so I'm hearing that to sort of address this issue in some way, there's interest in doing that, and so we can put something together and bring it back to you. Is there a downside in? Any un, un, unanticipated consequences? You might want to add a foot to it to accommodate the roof, you know, <laughs> in between, but otherwise I think that was the intent there. I was, I was thinking about that a little bit and worried that maybe this would um, discourage pitched roofs in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Like roofs, <laughs> or maybe maybe encourage flat roofs. We have that the standard that is in the village that we allow extra height for a pitched roof. We could come back with some form of that to yeah. see if the planning commission is interested. I mean, to, to Peter's point, we could just apply the same type of um, massing stipulation of the daylight plane. And I mean, we do, but it just seems like greater massing within the roof area could present the same problem, but in a different way. Okay. All right. we'll, we'll come back with some additional ideas. Yeah. Okay. Well, this, we'll, we'll plan for what meeting we can get on next to bring more changes to you as we work through. I did want to I have a director's update for you if we're ready to move into the next. Thank you for all your great comments this evening. Very helpful. Are we going to talk about the other items we got in our agenda packet? Not this evening. I just have one minor, minor comment. I think where there's something in here about uh, a bar. I think we need to come up with a definition in our glossary of what a bar is and what we're talking about there, because that could be a wine bar, taco bar, a liquor bar, you know, just a definition when we come back. Thank you. Any other comments on the future list? Shall I jump into the directors? Room? Yes. Sir, yeah, I just have one update on the housing element update. So after me, the, the meeting we had two weeks ago, the direction that we could move to 75 feet on the mall site, keep it at the mall site, and allow the FAR to have an exception for parking garages, um, took the same conversation to the city council. And while we were there, there Merlone Geyer Representative David Gazer, Lizer stood up and he also brought up a new aspect of this in that um, the number of affordable units placed on the mall is is too high and a burden and um, they don't see themselves redeveloping with uh, the, I think there was like 460 affordable units just on the Merlon Geyer sites. So uh, city council directed us to continue working with Merlon Geyer and um, we, they also directed us to move forward with publishing an update to the housing element while working with Merlone Geyer. So I've had meeting, I had a meeting today with Merlone Geyer, and I've had two meetings with our housing consultant. And at this point, we're thinking of um, kind of sharing the love amongst the whole mall site. Before, we didn't include the target, we didn't include the Macy's site or the um, the Ross site, 
No, so where we're going to increase the height to 75 feet for the whole mall parcel, we're doing the analysis of what 15%, our inclusionary ordinance requires 15%, what 15% spread over that whole site looks like. And that's, um, it's looking like it might work out that we'll have enough um, on that site if we include the other parcels and not put such a heavy burden on the Malone Geyer. So I was very confused about that. I was watching that city council and, and he talked about that was a 419 units or that sounds like way more than 15%, right? I mean, it is. Yeah. So where, where, why, why, does, why is that such a huge number? Yeah, it's the way that our consultant has been advising us through the process. Um, and it's how just based on the, the overall size of those lots, and building, I think it was that uh, we put in a density of 29 units per acre, which now with the 75 feet, it'll be 48 units per acre. So we're just trying to make the economics of this work as well. But to your point, it it is high, the number. Um, and when you have development projects come in, like some of, two of our development projects this year are 100% affordable. And so as we see different projects come in, these numbers will balance out. We expect that we're going to have to utilize that additional buffer that we've been putting in the housing element for no net loss. So if, if Merlon Geyer were to come in tomorrow and they said, to make this feasible, we can only produce the 15% that's required by code, we would then use our no net, we'd have to make no net loss findings and find additional sites um, in which that buffer could be used to say that we can still produce this housing somewhere else so I also got the sense that they weren't interested in in increasing their numbers up to 1300 units because uh, the argument was that that's too many affordable units 400 units right and so the ratio it's the impression I got was the ratios were wrong they needed more high-end units and so they weren't willing from what I could tell to increase the total number of units up to as much as 1,300 units, which was something that, a number that was bandied about. They didn't seem to, to jump on that. Did, did Was there any discussion about the increasing the total number of units when you talked to them? So they, when I talked to them, they said they think our math is correct now at 75 feet, 48 units per acre is what we'll be looking at. So they agreed with the math. They have not been working on our project so they really haven't been say like they're not willing to go there in terms of like what what numbers they're looking at and without we don't have a density limit there but they're saying that they agree with our assessment with ground floor commercial and then living space above five stories of living space above yeah in the, in the model i sent you before i updated it to include the higher Roof height, and they can get 1,289 units with a with a far of 2.0, and that ends up at a density of only 25 per acre, mm -hmm. and they should be able to afford. Um, they should they should have plenty of um, market rate units to offset the affordable housing. So yes, I don't yeah. quite get their argument. Oh, to de to only provide the 15 yeah. percent. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. The math does to me the math works in their favor as now that we've raised the height and taken the parking out of the FAR calculation and you still will stay within the 2.0 FAR. Like, you guys should be happy mm -hmm. <laughs> by my calculations, but I don't know. I'm just trying. I'll send you this new model and you okay. can look at it. Thank you. So that's, I'm hoping to have um, the updated housing element published on the Friday before our next meeting, and then I'll bring an update to you at the next meeting in March. And that concludes my director's report. Thank you. Thank you. And can we ask a question? I do have a question about the wharf, if I'm allowed. Commission comment. So now that we're going to demolish the bait shop and the restaurant, there's not like what are we? Gonna, are we just going to deck over top of what's there now, or leave a hole? I mean, how, how I'm not sure how the how that works. What's because the construction company has plans that include those two um, buildings. 
So with the demolition of the building, the deck will definitely be replaced. Before that, um, we were doing some of, some of the pilings were being fixed underneath the buildings. This will actually give us really good access and we can um, repair more, um, more of the pilings underneath the buildings. Um, in terms of, we're, we'll definitely run the utilities out there for future use. There, there's been no decisions on what happens next. There's discussion on whether or not the bathroom should, the, you know, the Portland Loo, should it be installed at this point? And I think that's part of what these, you know, the town hall discussion next week is to get feedback and then city council will make the ultimate decision. But um, at this point, you, you should expect to see a the flat deck all the way out to its um, where it was planned to be built. And it's in really bad condition right now because we lost so many more of the boards in this last storm too on the front of the wharf. So um, but the utilities will be run. The bathroom was in that condition of uh, state funding. So that I think right now uh, with that bathroom, I know Jessica is doing a lot of research to see exactly what, what can happen with that bathroom. and due to what's yeah, I thought it was conveyed to us and that was like really a hinge point for state funding like you know it was like when, when we were talking about how the, some of the feedback from the community was about the bathroom having to be there and the type it was I thought it was pretty clear stated that it was really connected back to the, how the funding was set up for the wharf and that it would jeopardize if that wasn't put out there so Yeah. yeah, yep. But we're going to get a rebate from the construction company because it's a lot easier with those buildings gone to do this project, right? Mm. Yeah. If, I were, if I were negotiating this contract and I was a commercial operation, that's what I would ask. You guys, you guys bid this thing with those buildings in your way while you replace pylons underneath it. Now you have full access. It's going to take you a fraction of the time. Give me some money. Or no, the, something else. the cost of the new pilings versus doing the sleeve is less, so there will be a cost savings there. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think the bathroom conversation, just to go back, I think that was tied to the like the state contract. I don't know if it was, I think it was already bid that way with a bathroom out there and had to be followed. So I, I think we're working through all of that currently under the new circumstances. But. Maybe that can just be brought. We're going to get a, a wharf update, it sounds like, in March, right? So. Yes. And um, we'll be bringing the, the other bathroom that Exalu was delivered. <coughs> we'll be bringing some other options for you in terms of colors and possibly materials. But in the new wharf design, I guess, with the potential that the bathroom, the, um, the buildings won't be there, uh, Jessica, I guess, will research and give us an update if that bathroom. Had, I mean, there's concerns about that bathroom being out there, but we thought it was going to be pretty sheltered from other buildings from a viewing standpoint. If there's nothing out there and there's just one single stall, <laughs> um, might be even more. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, maybe she can um, update that. I, I really thought it was pretty clear. Maybe it was Kayla. She might even know that it was really much. It, it had to go there because it was really based on. Uh, the funding from the state that it was part of the project. So maybe that can be alleviated because of the storm damage or something. We will see. I'll, I'll look into that for, for sure. All right. Thanks. Okay. Any, anybody else questions? No? All right. Then we're adjourned. Thank you. Um, we're adjourned to the next regularly scheduled meeting of the planning commission on March 7th, 2024 at 6 PM. Thank you. Thanks.